All right. So, well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for being here, for attending this final multiplayer event of the ILSA project. It's great to see so many familiar names that were coming up in the chat with all the weather reports from all over the world, including Annie has information about her wearing flip-flops today for the presentation. Um, so it's great to see you all um, and to, to have you there for what is going to be the final event for us. Um, the ILSA project started um, in 2017, so that's three years ago. We're about to finish now. It's a three-year project. Um, the name is Interlingual Life of Declan for Access, and it belongs to this Erasmus Plus call, which is mainly focused on training, but it does have some research elements that we have included, especially at the beginning of the project. This is just a brief presentation um, to kind of set you up for what's going to come next and give you general information about the project and we, what we have done, mostly about the questions that we've we've had to to tackle. Um, the partners in the project, our team made up of the University of Vigo, uh, University of Vienna, uh, and, and we're, uh, so then IntroPR, which is a, a company providing um, live subtitles in different forms and settings, and then Vierte being um, the broadcaster that we have, in this case the Belgian broadcaster from the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, Flemish-speaking. So that's the, the consortium, and um, the name of the project is, as I said, Interlingual Life Subtitling, but as we moved throughout these three years and we progressed with the project, we realized that many things were changing and even, I would say, we had to rethink the way we um, thought about the project and about the, the word subtitling. So subtitling itself became a bit of a question because we said, well, um, we are dealing with three speakers and they make, as you know, they produce subtitles with their voice using speech recognition. But what they produce is not always subtitles. So what we can see here on the screen is um, actually they are not titles that are displayed underneath any image. But in this case, we're talking about a live event a conference and there's a screen that is filled up with words. So it's a form of, if you like, speech to text interpreting, but not exactly or not always subtitles. It's not only or always TV that we are making accessible. Um, so we started thinking a bit more about terminology and where we are in the complex map uh, in which we're moving. Uh, more information about this will be provided by Franz Boshacker uh, when he presents our third deliverable, which we call IO3. But just to give you an idea, um, we are tending to use the current, the, the, the umbrella term speech to text interpreting or live titling, just to not only restrict the idea to subtitles. Um, you could do that with different methods, um, whether or not they are automatic, they could be normal keyboards or steno stenotyping, with re-speaking and with more um, automatic methods and this is where we are so I think basically what we'd like to say is that we are focusing on this project we're focusing on interlingual re-speaking which we could call trans speaking that's what we are focusing on um, as a form of speech to text interpreting or, or live titling and this could apply to TV or to live events this is what exactly ILSA has been focusing on um, just to give you an idea of what this is like I mean many of you will have seen even the intralingual um, variant of re-speaking. Um, I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to share with you a video. Um, so just a second video of uh, the result of interlingual re-speaking so you can hear um, what's going on and see it as well. That works. The line. Hi, Drex. Hi, I'm Drex. Welcome, comma. How are you, Pedro? Question mark. Pedrex. I just got off a plane recently from a couple of months in the Amazon period. I'm Drex. So your jet lag is mental and physical. So hopefully uh, you will have been able to see and hear some of that. It's difficult to know, but hopefully you will have. Let me just uh, share my presentation. And that would be an example of interlingual re-speaking or trans-speaking that has been um, done by one of our students who has been trained with the um, materials in the ILSA course. 
So just back to my presentation. And this is this station, an interlingual re-speaker, another interlingual re-speaker who's hopefully going to be with us today, Nancy Guevara. We, she was trained as well with ILSA materials. Um, and you can see all the different post-it notes that she has around her screen uh, with all the different macros and, and commands that she has to use when she's um, re-speaking interlingually. Uh, you can see her on the screen, and I think this was for a, kind of a business meeting. So she will be she will be listening to the original in, for example, English, and then providing a translation um, into Spanish. I think it is, yeah. And she can see the text at the, at the bottom, the, the text that she's producing. So the questions for us were: What do we do with this? I mean, we know that this can exist, but what can we do in order to train uh, interlingual speakers? So we asked some questions that we wanted to find answers to through this project, which was how is re-speaking currently being trained and delivered, both intra and interlingual? We wanted to have a, an answer for that. Is it feasible? And by it, I mean interlingual now, uh, because it's quite new, not completely new, but quite new. Is interlingual re-speaking feasible? And if so, what is the preferred background and skills? What would be the profile of the interlingual re-speaker and, and the competences? What would a training course look like? What uh, training materials would be needed to train an interlingual re-speaker? Does the course work if we create one? How do we assess the quality of that course? And finally, how can we implement or how can interlingual re-speaking be implemented either on TV or in live events and educational settings? Yeah. So this, all these objectives then turned into um, intellectual outputs, uh, which is the name that the different deliverables of the project um, has in, in, in these kind of projects. So we did an assessment of re-speaking training and practice in order to know what's going on in terms of training and practice. Um, we did a competence analysis. These two IOs are ones that I will just, I'll just talk you through some of the results today because what we have for the rest of the presentations today is answers to the other IOs. So, Profile definition will be presented by Franz Bosaka. IO for mapping the ILSA done by Isabel Perez by the EU Antwerp team. The training material will be talking about this. This will be presented by every kind of group or people who um, created the materials. Quality assessment will be done by Jesus Merino and Heli Dawson. The assessment of the course that is that we have created, and finally. The guidelines or protocols that we have uh, produced will be presented by the Polish team. So it's only IO 1 and 2 that I'd like to go over now because we didn't include them as formal presentations. But I just wanted to give you uh, the gist of, of what we have found out. This was the very beginning of a project, of course. So in order to know what's out there in terms of training and practice, we um, produced a survey. We have some results that we will share with you uh, in different publications. But I mean, the idea is that there is some face-to-face -face and online training for intralingual re-speaking, mostly but not only within audiovisual translation courses. But we have found, and, and we, we to, a, to, to a large extent, we were aware of this, that there's not enough training going on for the demand that we actually find. I'm talking intralingual re-speaking here. And there are very different national practices, um, depending on different issues on how uh, the setup for re-speaking is, is approached. But for interlingual re-speaking, very, very sporadic practice, um, and virtually no formal training, at least three years ago, very little training. Um, and the demand has grown considerably now. So all these, I mean, obviously, much more thorough results can be found in two articles where, where um, our colleagues have kind of disseminated the results of those uh, of the survey. That's for the first deliverable or I.O. For the second one, we conducted some experiments, mostly um, conducted by Haley Dawson, who, uh, whose thesis was kind of, whose PhD thesis was aligned with the ILSA project. Um, and in different publications, uh, she tested the feasibility of interlingual re-speaking. And um, she found with different experiments that lasted, that had different durations, that thorough training is needed in order to for, for trainees to perform as they are expected. Um, she tested exper in experiments with uh, 
uh, a couple of days training, then with some weeks training, then with a month training, and we're looking at a three to six month period to be able to train interlingual speakers. Three tasks stand out as the most important ones, multitasking, life translation, and dictation to speech recognition software. Um, and then who is better suited is a difficult question, but um, most of the tests were done with simultaneous interpreters who tend to perform quite well, intralingual re speakers, um, and subtitlers, some of them actually managed to perform very well as well when they were very good at multitasking and, and life translation. So, so different profiles could be suited depending on the training and their, and their performance. Again, this is just a brief summary and, and more information uh, can be found in this thesis indeed and then other articles that we have been publishing. So all this information is available um, and it sets us up to, to be to then define the profile of the interlingual re-speaker um, and then and then attend the course as well. And before we do that, so I'll give a floor to, uh, well, I, I guess we'll have questions and answers, but Franz will be presenting soon, um, IO3. But before I said, before we do that, um, I just wanted to leave you with some thoughts that we can kind of hold on to for later as well, and about aspects that we have kind of been noticing throughout these three years. And one is, what do we know about the birth and development new technique of interlingual speaking? Um, in a way, it, it, it has quite a lot of parallels with uh, inter, um, conference interpreting. So can we learn anything of, of when conference interpreting started and, and what was done then that could be useful for now? Because it's quite a, a similar, um, in many ways, a similar technique. Um, the current relevance of interlingual re-speaking has increased exponentially due to the, uh, obviously, the pandemic and the situation we're, we're going through and the importance of remote access. And interestingly, of course, interlingual re-speaking brings together access and translation. So either in the same room or in the same online meeting, you could have uh, people with hearing loss and without hearing loss who are needing the same sort of access, either because they don't have access to the audio or because they don't have, have they don't have the knowledge of the language that is being spoken. So it's a nice way of bringing together people with and without in laws with the same need for access and translation. And finally, of course, uh, how does interlingual speaking compare to the alternative methods that are out there, which could be fully or semi-automatic. That is, the recognition part could be done automatically or the machine translation part, and how does that compare to what we are dealing with here. So all these questions just have uh, at the back of our minds as we see the presentations and they will be dealt with and addressed and discussed um, in the panel that we'll have at the very end of the event. So that's it for me. Thank you very much uh, for being here and over to you Isabel for any questions and then obviously to Franz um, so that he can present IO3.